Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to New Beginning Celebration. We are excited that the Lord has created and made this day for us to be alive and to worship and celebrate new beginnings in Jesus Christ. We welcome each one of you who have come to us by way of social media, YouTube, Facebook, uh, whichever one of those you have chosen to watch this uh, this sermon or this message on. We are excited. We thank you and we welcome you once again. Thank you for being a part of, of, of what we're doing here at New Beginning Celebration. We are excited to be in the hand of the Lord and doing what he has called us to do. So may this day and this time that you spend with us be well spent. We're going to do what we have to do, not to waste your time. I am Pastor Damon, again, shepherd of, of, of God in the flock of God here at New Beginning Celebration and in and throughout the city of New Bern. It doesn't just stop here in the church, but there's many, many other lives that we get to share the word of God with or share the love of God with as well throughout the entire city. Um, and so pray for your pastors, wherever you are. If you have a pastor, pray for your pastor because it's just, if, if he's doing what he's supposed to do, it just doesn't end when he walks out the door on Sunday morning. Somebody is calling and texting and looking for him and stopping him in the grocery store that they never even walked in your building. Okay. And trust me, he, he can lose a lot of sleep, drive a lot of hours into dark paths down the dark wooded roads that you've never seen that you'd be afraid to drive down pray for your pastor all right we are in a series uh here called what prayer that always manifests an answer. effective prayer that always manifests an answer thank you got to get the title down too i want i want all of this i, I want y'all to have all of this effective prayer that always manifests an answer we fall so short on having God active in our lives, giving us the desired results of things that we have asked or prayed for or so-called prayed for. Because oftentimes we get the little thing, well, it's just talking to God. But we're finding in this series, it's not just talking to God. You wouldn't like it if I approached you in, a, in any old kind of way. Hey, you stupid. Or if you called me by a name that I didn't like or didn't approve of. I mean, I don't mind being called cuz, but what if I was, you know, I had told you, well, don't call me cuz. Call me Damon. You can come up cuz, well, I ain't going to want to listen to you. Young man, go to our church right now. You know, there was a nickname, kind of a, a shortcut of his name given to him some years ago when he was in the things he didn't, he really now detest in his life. So he says, please call me my whole first name. Don't, don't cut it short with this. And me being one who'd known him for a long time, always called him that little shortcut name. But now I see that it's associated with something that was dark and painful to him. So I have to work hard now to call him what his name is. Jesus says, when the disciples asked to teach us how to pray, Jesus says, you pray in this manner, our Father. You still got people think, ah, it doesn't matter, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, they're all God. And because they're all God, God is okay. Dear God, dear Lord, y'all know what I'm going to say, right? Yes, sir. Ricky Bobby's favorite. Ricky Bobby said, oh, sweet baby Jesus. That's right. That's right. Oh, dear, dear old Holy Spirit. But Jesus said to say it how? Our Father. That's direct disobedience. Direct disobedience. You see it, you read it, and you're going to do it your way anyway. How do you think your prayer going to get answered? You're not even talking to the right person of the Godhead. You just made an open shame of Jesus Christ's work on the cross to tear the, 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 the temple, the, the curtain of the temple in two. The veil of the temple was written, ripped in two and rent in two so that you may have access to the throne of God. So then Hebrews declare, now that you can come boldly to the throne of grace, that you might find grace, that you might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So when Jesus says, our Father, you have access directly to the Father now. 
because of what he did through and by his shed blood and death on the cross. <coughs> so when you think you want to call the Father or pray <coughs> by any other name of the Godhead, you have just disgraced what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Y'all get it? I'm real careful about just asking any old body to pray for me. Because I want to make sure you know how to pray. So there's a very select few people that say pray for me. <clears throat> so the title of this sermon series is Effective Prayer That Always Manifests and Answer. Effective prayer that always manifests and answers. We had part one last week. It was the purpose and power. The purpose and the power. Well, today we're going through part two, the pipeline and the platform. The pipeline and the platform. We are still examining effective prayer that always manifests and answer. <clears throat> Our foundational verse for this series <coughs> is James 5 and 16. James 5, 16b. And that's, that means the last half of the verse. Generally, if we're in Bibleology, that's what we do. Sometimes there may be three sections to a verse, but generally two parts to a verse that We'll say 15a or 15b. So James 5 and 16. And the Bible reads thus. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effectual or effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Everything around this verse before and after testifies of the power and impact of its truth. If you'll read right there in James chapter 5, right around the area of that verse before and after, you'll see what he's talking about. <clears throat> in fact, turn with me to James 5, 13 through 18, and let's read this passage. Thought you was going to get away with it, didn't you? I know we're going to turn some pages in here. We're going to turn some pages in this church. To me, it's a sweet sound. Going down when I hear these pages turn on the day shift. Come on, somebody. Y'all know this is my song. Right? So listen to what James says here in James 5, 13 through 18. And after we read through this passage, we're going to pray a little bit. James 5, 13 through 18 reads, Is anyone among you suffering? What is, the, what is the conclusion to that? What, do you, what should you do? Let him pray. There's a lot of suffering going on out here in this world right now. Right now. Some of us are suffering through some events and some things, situations and circumstances. Why is our mouths closed? Don't just pray in your skull. Open the tongue. Let that tongue move. Open the mouth. Verbalize it. When you pray, you don't have to pray loud enough for everybody else to hear it if you're, if you're around other people, but move the lips, open the mouth, waggle the tongue. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Oil, at this particular time, then and even now, certain oils have medicinal properties. Uh-oh. It ain't just slapping your forehead full of olive oil, letting it just drip down like jerry curl juice. You walking around looking like some glossed up. This is, uh, this is it has medicinal purposes. And the anointing also represents the smearing of the Holy Spirit's presence on a person. So in the Old Testament, when we read about the anointing oil, but it says anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. I think we've identified what the prayer of faith is. 
The prayer cannot be a prayer of faith if it's not loaded with God's word. For faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it's got to be loaded with either the word of God, the principles of God's word. It has got to be word laced. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, let me help you understand something. If you pray the, uh, the prayer of faith, with you praying it uh, uh, by yourself or with someone else, do you know you're actually also, while you're praying, preaching a mini sermon to that person? Do you know if you're praying the prayer of faith loaded with God's word, do you know that their faith is increasing? That their confidence of what you are praying is building that there is a clarity of mind and sight into what is going on when you pray, when you pray the prayer of faith. If it's a prayer of faith, it's loaded with God's word. Thy word shall be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You are actually starting to administer and minister to that person when you pray the prayer of faith properly because it's loaded with God's word. It's not just a prayer to God, but while you're talking to God, so God's going to be responding to his word. That person is hearing it and having confidence because what are you doing? You're, you're speaking those things to be not as though they were or though they are right into their ear gate, building their faith. And all they see now is Jesus, not you praying because Jesus is the word. So all they see while you're praying is Jesus Christ. Keep going. That's why when we pray in here sometime on Tuesday nights, and we do our Tuesday night prayer on the fourth Tuesday night, which y'all talk about when it's all over. <laughs> it got nothing to do with me. It's got something to do with the, the, the word of God that now has been imparted to my heart and my mind. And when I get sensitive to the Holy Spirit, or when you get sensitive to the Holy Spirit, when we get sensitive to the Holy Spirit leading, he will, re, he, will, he will call that word back up. He will call it to our remembrance. Oh, I'm sorry. You haven't been in the word enough to have anything called to your memory. Okay. You got to give him something to work with. What's that? Confess your trespasses one to one another and pray for one another. Okay, okay, so if there are problems in your life, what do you do? You talk about it with someone. Find that one trusted friend that's deep, whether it's your pastor or the sister sitting next to you or the brother sitting next to you. Don't just go talking to anybody out there in the world. Don't go talking to them friends and them scuttlebutts that don't know anything about Jesus Christ. We don't want the skunk mollies to get a hold of our information so it can get spread around town. Now, now you got some serious praying to do. Go talk with that person that can walk alongside of you that you know you can trust. I have a couple of people that work with me like that. I have, I have people in this church like that. Confess your trespasses one to another. Confess your faults. Confess your issues. And pray for one another that you may be healed. We don't do enough of that in the community. So we're constantly still talking about praying. That friend is not there to beat you up, but that friend is born for that adversity. That you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Listen to this story now. This is what I was talking about when I said everything around this verse before and after testifies of the power and impact of its truth. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years, three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Do you know historians have been able to trace this moment of time? Okay. Historians have written about it in secular publications. That there seemed to be a time in the past where there was like no rain on the earth for a period of three to four years. How powerful can your prayers be? And here's the point that's being made is that 
The Bible says Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. Now, let me help you understand a secret. The Holy Spirit at that time only came upon people. Did not indwell anyone who believed. It only came upon. Only what Jesus did with the work on the cross, again, opened the door to your heart. The veil of that temple was torn to, and the Holy Spirit came in and sat on the throne. We let him anyway. Some of us trying to kick him off the throne fast as we can. But the Holy Spirit came in and sat on the throne. So now how much more powerful can our prayers be than even Elijah's? Well, we've got the communicator that helps us communicate our prayers to God dwelling right in us. In fact, we, got, we have God dwelling in us. You don't have to look to the heavens. You can look to the ground. You can look to the side. You can stand, sit, fall, lay, kneel, bow. Because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Be in the shower, driving down the street in the car, sitting at your desk at work. He was a man with a nature like ours and prayed earnestly <coughs> that it would not rain. And it did not rain. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this day, this hour, and this time that has come. We thank you, Father, that you have given us life, health, and strength today. And we thank you for the privilege that you have given us to be your children through, this, through the salvation provided in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. So we thank you for penetrating our heart with your word, for building faith in our hearts, faith to believe in you and receive our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible does say that if we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. <coughs> for with the heart, man believes. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Help us to do it like you said, Lord, because some people out here are not saved. They just think they are because they've thought about those verses in their mind and never uttered a word. So today, Father, we want to fill this room with your glory. Let your spirit move mightily and assist each one of us in growing in Christ so that we can be more mature in our prayer life, so that we can be more pointed, more directed, and so that <clears throat> the benefits you have in store for us can pour down and rain down on us and rain in and to and through our lives so that we can be vessels of honor on this earth, revealers of your glory, conduits of your power, and the benefits of your kingdom being built and growing. We love you, Father. We thank you. Help me to decrease so that you may increase, so that as I utter your words today through this teaching, that you will fill us with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and all spiritual understanding so that we may walk fully pleasing unto you and worthy of your calling. We love you, Father. We thank you, for you are amazing. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. We have understood that the power in prayer that makes it effective and fervent. We have understood that. What's that power? What's that power in prayer? Word. The word. The word of God is the power. Jesus Christ, the word of God. Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God, the power of God. <clears throat> it's in 1 Corinthians. Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God, the power of God. So we have understood the power of God in prayer that makes it effective and fervent. Now we will learn what vehicle God has given for us or given us for this power to travel. And this vehicle is faith. This vehicle is faith. Faith is a verb. <clears throat> it's active. It is an action. Faith is a verb. It's an action. It's not a noun. It's not a thing. It's mobile. It's active. The Bible tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. So now we take a vehicle, a noun, a thing, and we 
turn it into an action. We have to. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen or not seen. This isn't going to be an exhaustive study on faith, but a study on the role that faith must play. See, there's a role. There it is. So now we take this thing and it's got to become mobile. It's got to become movable. The, the, the role that faith must play in effective praying so that positive results are guaranteed. Okay. Faith equals substance of things. Faith is tangible. It's substance of things. So it's a noun that goes into being a verb. It's the substance of things. Faith is the evidence of things. If I want proof of something, you got to give me evidence. If I want proof that somebody said Nolan Ryan pitched 100 miles an hour while he was yet still 50 years old getting ready to, getting ready to retire, show me proof. Give me evidence. So I have to actually see him do it then, right? He's on video. The man is throwing triple digits at 50. But faith now has to become our evidence. Our, well, let's, let's, see, let's see what all this is about. Let's keep going. Substance is tangible. It is defined as a setting under support, essence of or of an assurance, which stands or is set under a foundation, it is maybe even beginning. Substance, the foundation, the quality or of confidence, excuse me, the quality of confidence which leads one to stand under. Substance, the quality or confidence which leads one to stand under, endure or undertake anything. Wow. The quality of confidence. That's the emphasis there. Substance. Platform seems to be another word that emerges from this definition, doesn't it? Setting under, support, essence, assurance. Something which stands or is set. Something that is under, something that is a foundation or beginning. So that word platform does seem to emerge from this definition. Evidence is proof or conviction. Evidence is the next word. Substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But you can see where we get the word platform in our subtitle. We are told that if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Mark 9, 23. If you can believe, if you can believe, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe. The man responded to Jesus right after that. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. Listen, I've, I've gone this far in my believing, but I know there's plenty more room for me to grow. He said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. He was very transparent. He told Jesus the truth. Jesus, God is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and the truth. The Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. That man was truthful. He said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And guess what happened? Jesus healed the man's son. All those crazy epileptic seizures just stopped. Now, he convulsed the boy one more time, tried to just, while he's coming out, tried to destroy him. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I ain't worried about that, which I already know is good. I need you to tend to that which isn't there yet. <laughs> How many things are possible by believing? If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. We must stop putting limits on God because of the magnitude of the situation or circumstances surrounding our lives. Believing God's word and exercising faith therein takes all the limits off. Believing God's word and exercising faith 
There goes that verb again. Takes all the limits off of God. Jesus says, have faith in God. Mark eleven twenty two. So now we got a place or a, a place of point for our faith. I keep hearing people talk, just throw that word around. Well, you know, he's a man of faith. Faith in what? Please, I, I, and I, I've heard some of y'all in here have that cliche in your mouth. Faith in what? You're not, you're not declaring anything about the Lord because you say, well, I have faith. Period. I got faith my car is going to crank in the morning when I put the key in and turn the ignition over. I got faith this microphone is going to continue to work as I speak into it. Because right now I currently still see the lights on, so I know there's power getting to the system over here like there's power getting to the lights. Please let's stop falling into the world's Christianese. We have faith in God. We have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. We have faith in the word of the Holy Bible. Stop having this bold, covered up Christianity, for lack of a better word. Let, let's stop it. That, that's just a way of not offending someone who doesn't want to hear the name Jesus. Well, I, he's, well, I got faith. I, to this day, want to crucify a news station in Raleigh, North Carolina, WTVD 11. I'm going to put it on blast. But when I say my faith is in Jesus Christ about something that was going on with the law changing, they cut off my, my, my commentary about Jesus Christ and said, and King says his faith will get him through. Fake news. Thank you, Mr. Trump. You told the truth. Fake news. And if many of you think about it, you'll know about stories that the news has talked about and it wasn't quite right. Fake news. I'm with Trump. They're liars. Let's not, let's not, because see, faith doesn't offend anybody just to say you got faith. I know people named faith. I got faith, she's standing right over him. I mean, somebody, I mean, it's just that easy. We used to go to church with somebody named faith. She's sitting right over there. You got faith? Yeah, I, I got faith. She's hanging out with us today. Faith in what? Jesus says, have faith in in God, I know I'm spending a lot of time on this because we're lukewarm, watered down, and we let the world shape it. We have let the world shape us into its mold. But the Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove whether it's that good and perfect and acceptable will of faith. No, of God. This statement was made to the disciples after Jesus cursed the fig tree. And they had difficulty believing that the fig tree had dried up so quickly. But let us back up for just a moment. There's a time when Jesus teaches his disciples to what the kingdom of God is like. Let's go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Don't worry, I'm going to be nice. I'm going to be nice. But we've got to get this. This is this is this is troubling times, folks. And you have to you have to mark the reality of what the troubling times are, in order to drive you to your knees for prayer, in order to try drive you before the throne of grace for prayer. See, we we waited in life now until there is a an, an emergency urgency, instead of just praying all the time. Instead of just praying all the time, just pray. I hope everybody is not waiting to have some kind of extended prayer when we come in here on fourth Tuesday night. Mark 4, 30 through 32. So Jesus is going to talk to us about the kingdom of God. What is it like? We're still talking about prayer. 
We're still talking about the pipeline and the platform. To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? Now he's going to tell that, he's going to tell that parable. It is like a seed, like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds of the earth or on earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs, shoots out large branches so that birds of the air may nest under its shade. Keep going before I jump, jump the gun. It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown in the ground, is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. This to a tree. Let's keep going. Let's examine the interpretation and practical application of Mark 4, 30 through 32. Let's examine it a little bit. We're going to keep going. So the mustard seed. Anybody ever seen a mustard seed? If you have it, go buy a pack of them. You're going to cost much. Pass them out to people. What, what, what a treat. Hold out your hand. I got something for you. You know what that is? That's a mustard seed. That's a mustard seed. Jesus said, if you have that much faith, some great things can happen. But that's a mustard seed. But do you know that that mustard seed, that little tiny seed right there, can grow up to be a tree big enough where the birds of the air can nest under its branches? That's in the Bible. Mark 4, 30 through 32, if you want to read it. A witnessing tool. It's a witnessing tool. Because there's one thing the world knows. Clichéic Christian ease. Well, they say if you have the faith of a mustard seed. <laughs> All right, let me keep going because I got something to say about that. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the earth. So listen, you get into the kingdom of God. You have got enough faith now to believe and get into the kingdom of God. That's your mustard seed. But what we're here to do, and this is why I'm the type of teaching pastor I am, is because I'm here for the edification of the church, which means to help the church grow and improve. For the building up of the church. For growth. Jesus states right here, but when it is sown, it what? Grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs. The church is supposed to become greater. You as an individual is supposed to become greater than all of everything else on the earth that is contrary to the kingdom of God. The word of God is supposed to be growing in you so that you become greater than all the other things on earth. Not in a haughty way or a high-minded way. So that you can walk in that overcoming power, Jesus said. In this world, you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world, and whatsoever is born of God has overcome the world. Whatever has that mustard seed planted in it, nurture it, water it, fertilize it with more of the word of God, and guess what? It will walk in that overcoming power that's already established in the seed. But if we don't water the seed, if we don't help the seed grow, we will never become that, that grown up now, mighty valor, Mighty and valor, man of God or woman of excellence. Because we haven't grown, we're still mustard seed youngins. Our faith is still at mustard seed level. Shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest in this shade. Is anybody going to be able to run to you for cover when they see everything falling apart? Is anybody going to be able to run to you for answers when they see things not as they thought it should be in this world? Are people coming to rest under the shade of God's word because they see you growing and mature as a Christian or they still see you as a... Well, I know the Lord's going to help us. 
Just keep your faith in Jesus Christ. Just keep trusting the Lord. Or you're going to be one that can stand up and say, but don't you understand what the Bible says about this? That nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Don't you understand that the Bible says that you have been given authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you? Now we're growing up a little bit. <laughs> now we're becoming mature Christians because now all of a sudden that pipeline of the word of God that has helped me grow in faith through that pipeline of prayer, and now I can quote the word like I need to. And I've grown up enough where people are coming to me for answers. Can we say that, each one of us? We have to do it. We have to do it. That's just a question we need to ask ourselves. This is nothing to criticize anyone, say anyone's not doing it, or anyone is doing it. The bottom line is, you ask yourself, am I beyond mustard seed growth? And he said the entire kingdom of God is like that. Well, what did Jesus say? He said the kingdom of God is near you, the king, or the kingdom of God is among you. Now the kingdom of God is, he said, it's with you, it's near you, it's with you, and now it's in you. So where's the kingdom of God growing at? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How are people going to see the kingdom of God? Because Jesus said, now the kingdom of God is in you. He had three, three different statements. It's near you. And then he finished up with saying, it's in you. All right, here we go. Here we go. So the kingdom of God, that's what it's like. And it's growing constantly. There should be nothing about the kingdom of God, you as an individual, the word of God in and about your life that is not growing. I go amongst people all the time that work with these vehicles in racing and drag racing. They, they they work hard and search and scrape and claw for just one more little ounce of power that can make them one-tenth of a second faster. They never give up trying to help a machine grow. But we will neglect the growth of our life by not using the tools that God has given us in our toolbox. And them guys out there with all kinds of, they buy a new tool that costs more money than they'll ever get out of it to try to make their car go faster. Some of them will never win a, a national championship or a world championship or a championship at all that will help them to achieve payment for the tools that they purchased for the vehicle. But just to be greater and to grow in that which they are doing, they work diligently to make it happen. Christians, we have to do the same. We have to do the same. Now turn with me to Matthew 17 and 20. Matthew 17, verse 20. Matthew 17, verse 20. Thank you all for hanging with us out there. Appreciate you very much. Um, again, I, I hope that this is coming across really well, even over the, the airwaves or the streaming that you're doing. Turn with me to Matthew 17, 20. 17 and 20. And the Bible says, So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, because of your unbelief, now, they're asking, well, how did this fig tree end up drying up so bad? All right, so this is how, why he's giving this comment right away. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Explain this verse. Can you explain this verse to yourself? Right? Okay, so here we go. Check it out. Jesus said that because of your unbelief, that's why they can't, this wasn't actually about the fig tree here. This was about why they couldn't cast something out of a person, a demon. Because of your unbelief, by certain things that they couldn't do to heal somebody. Because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now I got a question for you. What is this mountain? 
Look at the verb. The mountain is in the verse, actually. Now, we can use this as a double reference, a literal mountain. But there's a mountain in this verse he's talking about. Right at the beginning, he said, because of your unbelief. You are, you are not able to do it because of this mountain of unbelief. So he says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain of unbelief, move from here to there and it will move. And when unbelief is out of the way, nothing will be impossible for you. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let me slow down. Let me slow down. When you tell unbelief to move, when you have faith, enough faith, just enough as a, of a mustard seed, unbelief out of the way. And how do you tell unbelief to move? By you empowering the word of God to take priority over unbelief. From here to there, get out of the way, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. See, what well, it was impossible for you because of your unbelief. So the unbelief is the mountain here. Just hit me last night like a ton of bricks. I've been reading this verse all my life. I'm 55 years old. And I sat here for 20 minutes in my home, looking at this verse. When you say to this mountain, if unbelief is out of the way, you will have no problem with anything being impossible. Because our belief and our faith is in God's word, and there is no impossibilities when God's word is on the scene. None. He said in Isaiah that he sends it forth out of his mouth and it will always accomplish that which he sent to it. It always does what pleases him and will not return unto him void, but accomplish that which he has sent unto it and prosper in the thing which he sent it, sent into it, sent it into. So his word always accomplishes and prospers and pleases him. The only thing that's going to hurt that is unbelief. Let's bring up a scenario, woman with the issue of blood, right? We talk about her frequently. She pops down on the ground and she touches the hem of his garment. She said, if I could only just put, touch the edge of his garment. And she touched it and he says, who touched me? He felt, and they said, well, well, well the disciples said, Jesus, what are you talking about? There's so many people thronging around you. There's no way possible that we can tell who touched you. Somebody touched me because I felt power leave me. The word of God, the power of God, the wisdom of God. We activate the word of God on the scene. <laughs> the living word of God said, I heard virtue. I felt virtue leave me. I felt power. Her faith, Jesus says, has made her whole. Now, I'm going somewhere. She touched the word of God with her faith. Literally with her hands, physically with her hands, but literally with her faith. That faith was the pipeline that pulled power from the word of God into that place that she needed to be lit up and empowered in her life. Your faith is just like the plug cord to the television over here. TV's got all the ability that they created the TV to have. The ability is there. But if you don't take faith and plug into the power, TV is good for nothing and everything is impossible for it to operate. So faith now has to be hooked into the power to wipe out unbelief. That mountain is going to move out of the way and nothing shall be impossible for that television to function as it is designed to function. Let's move forward. So we're going to leave Matthew 17, and now we're going to Matthew chapter 21. We're going four chapters later. We're going four chapters later. Matthew 21, 
21 through 22. Matthew 21, 21 through 22. And the Bible reads, So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but you will, if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. He didn't say whatever things you ask in prayer, you will receive. He said, whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Amazing. Amazing. I believe our friend Mark gives us a little bit more detail on this. Now, hold your spot right there. Hold your spot right there. I'm going to go to Mark 11. 22 through 24. I'm going to read Mark 11, 22 through 24. And the Bible reads, So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Right out the gate, let nothing distract you right now. God is your focus. He is the target of the arrow of faith that you're going to shoot. He is the place that you take that plug and plug into. Have faith in God. He is your power source. You don't plug into God and you're just wandering in the dark with everything else because it for sure will not support that which you have so desired. Have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. There's still faith in believing, faith in believing, faith in believing. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, we got faith in believing, faith in believing, faith in believing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work this for a second. Just a, a couple of quick little notes here. The Bible says, or the word faith from the Greek word is the word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, -I -S, pistis. That's the word faith that we're coming to from this particular verse. And it says persuasion, credence, conviction of truth or truthfulness, <laughs> and reliance upon. <clears throat> this is some of the basic definition of faith. Persuasion, credence, conviction of truth. Or truthfulness, reliance upon. Let me get my water open again so I can. There we go. Everybody got that? Believe. Very similar word. Pistis is from number 4102 in the Greek. <clears throat> believe is 4100 and it's the word pisteo p-i-s-t-e-u-o pisteo <clears throat> and it means to have faith in to entrust commit unto and place confidence in so we got reliance upon and faith and confidence in and believe. To commit unto and place confidence in. Believe means to be persuaded of. To be persuaded of. So we have persuasion as part of the definition of faith. And this is to be persuaded of. Faith is persuasion. That's a verb. And then believing is to be persuaded of. Be persuaded of what? That's why you can't just say, well, I believe. I got faith. You believe what? You have faith in who or what? It's crazy. It's tougher. It's tougher for people to say. Well, I have faith in Jesus Christ. It is to say, 
I have faith in you, boy. You can do it. Oh, man, we'll tell somebody in a minute. I got faith in you. You can do it. But to tell them that you have faith in Jesus Christ is, woo, Jesus. I mean, fear, fear, fear. You just said you have faith, but you're too afraid to tell somebody what your faith is in. Now, fear has overcome your faith. Those are the words. Jesus continues this interplay with faith and belief, faith and belief, faith and belief, faith and belief. So there's something to it. That's why I want to read the definition. You can't, you can't have one without operating in the other. You can't believe without operating in faith. And you can't have faith without believing. I hear people say you can have faith without believing or you can believe without having faith. That's not true. According to what Jesus is saying, that's not true. They have to work in concert together. All right, let me go back to where I was. So I'm going to come back here to what Jesus says in Matthew 21 and 22. 21, 21, and 22. <coughs> Listen. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we go back to Mark chapter 4, verse 30 and 32. The kingdom of God is like this. It's like a mustard seed. And he talked about the mustard seed growing <clears throat> from the seed to the full-grown plant. Right? When he did that, he was talking about these two passages from Matthew. Matthew 17, 20, Matthew 21, 21 through 22. What happened in this process? <clears throat> well, I don't know how many years or days of time. I have to study that to see how long it was between Matthew 17 and Matthew 21. I have to check that out. But whatever it is, it was more time because it's later. It's four chapters later in the Bible. Four chapters later could be a year and a half. <clears throat> we don't know. But whatever happened, Jesus and his disciples, whom he is talking to, are together. Jesus is constantly talking and teaching his disciples. They are all together. <clears throat> they are constantly hearing the word of God. They are together. They are walking in harmony with one another. What is happening to these disciples at this time for, that, for those four chapters? They should be growing in what? Faith. So Jesus finally tells them, well, in chapter 17, at the level where they are and what they should probably be able to do, if you have faith as, the, as a mustard seed, you can tell this mountain to move from here to there and it will happen. But listen, y'all, let's get rid of that Christianese. Well, if you just have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, now that's the literal scripture verse. But why is that always the one that comes out of our mouth when it's time to tell people, talk to people about growing and doing something or, or you know, expecting a move of God on their life? Why are we saved 30, some, some 20, 30, 40, 50 years <coughs> and still that's the verse that come out of our mouth? You know which one I like? I done, I done grew up a little bit. I think I walked with the Lord enough to believe this, that I've grown from mustard seed faith to mountain removing faith. See, the plant had to grow up. The mustard seed grows into a plant where it's effective for doing something. <clears throat> Spreading branches and providing something even for others. Well, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, can we grow up from that? So that we can be effective in the kingdom of God for something? I'd like to say, if you have faith and believe and do not doubt in your heart, you can say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. See, that's the difference. Because whatever is cast into the sea, you, you don't see anymore. It is no longer visible. And if you throw a mountain, a rock, <laughs> a big rock, a mountain down into the bottom of the ocean, do you think it's coming back out? It is gone forever. But if you just want to have mustard seed faith, you can have it. I don't mind. I'm not going to criticize you if that's where you want the level of your life to stay. 
So you're barely effective in your own life. It definitely will not be effective in anyone else's. Because a mustard seed faith tells the mountain to move from here to there. Well, I still see it. It's out of my way, but I see it. No, 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 no. See, I don't want to see you anymore. There was somebody in the Old Testament that told the children of Israel that. They were scared to death. Pharaoh and his army bear down. Yeah. And there's this body of water called the Red Sea standing right in the way. God said, Moses, stretch forth your staff. It opened up. God's still standing in between them as a pillar of fire blocking the way while the while there was a, I can't remember what the wind was now, a northeast wind or northwest wind blowing through that, the, 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 the area where the water has divided because it needed to dry. Read your Bible, not the movie. And all night long, God called a strong wind to blow down in the, in the valley uh, between the, the walls of water so that the water, the earth will dry up so it'll be strong enough for those two or three million people to go trouncing through it. He's a wise God. And he takes nature and uses it as his pleasure. And so for six, seven, eight, nine hours, however long it was, he held back the Egyptians and dried the ground. And they went walking right through it. Chariots, horses, everything. Buggies, livestock, the children of Israel went through to safety, through the Red Sea, through the Red. They were saved from sudden death and hell, and through the blood, they were delivered. The Red Sea, through the crimson. Say that one plus somebody else that want to hear it. <clears throat> <laughs> the blood delivered them the Red Sea and when they got to the other side they saw the Egyptians now God had moved out of the way and saw the Egyptians he got, I love God he's, he's amazing because he, he know they were scared so then all of a sudden he gets out of the way he lets them start through again here they come oh no and Moses kindly looked around at them and he says for these Egyptians that you see, you will see no more. And stretched out his staff one more time and cast into the bottom of the sea. Pharaoh and his army has never been seen from again. And you want Pharaoh's army just standing over there on the side looking at you? Well, then use your mustard seed. Because you're still going to be standing there with one eye on what, you, what you're going after and one eye to make sure they ain't coming your way. Or do you want the red blood of Jesus Christ that has already delivered you that you can stand up on, grow up in the word of God and let Pharaoh's army be cast into the depths of the sea so that they will never be seen no more. All right, we're talking about prayer. We're talking about prayer. Let's keep going. Lord Jesus, y'all going to dock me for time now. As spoken in these passages, our series has progressed from helping us um, that the word and God's glory coupled with our joy being full is the power and purpose. So God's word is the power. And then God's glory and our joy being full is the purpose for prayer. We saw that in the first part of the series. In this part, we see now Jesus only telling us to ask in the way of faith and believing, which is the pipeline and the platform. Believing is the platform. Faith is the pipeline. Let's keep going. Remember that 1 John 5, 14 talks about the confidence that we have in him, faith that we have in him, the confidence. Then this is, then this confidence and or faith can only come by the word of God and grows by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. 
It is this steady diet of the Word of God, walking with the Word of God, and hearing the Word of God that grows our faith from mustard seed faith to full-grown mustard plant faith, from mountain-moving faith to mountain-removing faith. What did I say happens here? It is this steady diet of the Word of God, disciples from chapter 17 to 21, walking with the Word of God, the disciples from chapter 17 of Matthew to, to, to Matthew 21, and hearing the Word of God, Matthew 17 to Matthew 21, that they grew up from a mustard seed to full mustard plant, from mountain-moving to mountain-removing faith. So now when they pray, good God from Zion, they either tear things wide open or tear it down. Matthew 17 to Matthew 21. Their faith had grown because there was a period of time there that the disciples spent with the word of God, with the word living, with the logos, the, the living word. In fact, we can see a consistent progression in Jesus' references to doubt and little faith, to unbelief, uh, to lies finally reflecting a faith that transcends all doubts, unbelief, and fears. You never saw in the last half of, 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 of the last six verses of Matthew, O ye of little faith, like you saw earlier. All of a sudden now, they're growing up. So there's some things he doesn't have to keep telling them or, or, or extracting from them or making them aware of that they're doing. Because now they don't do that anymore. They do exactly what they're supposed to be growing to do. I oftentimes tell people, you don't have to hear me repeat something if I see you doing it. I don't have to tell you to stand up and put left foot first and then right foot next to walk across the floor. Why? Because you're walking across the floor. Who has to tell you how to walk now? Your parents told you, stand up, stand up, stand up, when it was time to start standing and walking. And they tried to even demonstrate some of them to you, what you had to do. Move your little legs. But how many of you have been told how to walk in the last 50 years of your life? You know why you haven't been told by your parents how to walk? Because guess what they see? You're already walking. They don't need to waste their time about that. They need to talk to you about grown folk stuff. Why? Because you're going from mustard seed to mustard plant. It is finally re reflecting a life that transcends all doubt, unbelief, and fear. I don't need to talk to y'all about that anymore. I mean, we may have periodic discussions about it, and y'all are going to talk about it like grown folk. All right, here we go. I would like to expose us to a couple of conditional qualifiers. Please turn with me to 1 John 3, 22 through 23. 1 John 3, 22 through 23. First John 3, 22 through 23. And the Bible reads, when you get there, say faith. faith. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do. Uh-oh, we don't like that, do. When it comes to keeping his commandments. And do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment. That we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ. And love one another as he gave us commandments. That's our doing. Believing on the name of his son Jesus Christ. Believe, what, what is that? The word of God. John and them knew this principle, that to believe on the name of Jesus Christ was to believe on the word. Why am I just going to believe on just a, a, a human written name, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ? What is that telling me? It's not telling me anything, but that his name is Jesus Christ as an earthly man. But to believe on the name of Jesus Christ. Now, what's the name of Jesus Christ? It's the word of God. It's the word of God. So to believe on the name of Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. Are we loving one another? That's the other part. All right, let's keep going. Yeah, this is one of the most Christians. This, this, this is one of the most uh, uh, 
Christians refuse to believe because of his teaching that tell people to just pray regardless of our standing and state. I don't want to have to believe on the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ. I don't want to have to believe on the name of Jesus Christ. And I don't want to have to learn love some people if I don't want to. And we, we want to refuse to believe that this is part of the process, part of the pipeline and the platform. Then 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7 brings us, brings to us this admonition. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. The Bible reads, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they are without a word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. I'm not straight up here to preach about husbands and wives now, in case somebody just thinks I'm starting to try to do this again. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging of the hair, wearing of gold, or putting on a fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the uh, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Your marital relationship, I say it all the time, I wonder what blessings of God that some people are missing out on life because their relationship is topsy-turvy. One praying over there, one praying over there, they pray together, but their relationship is just nasty. I wonder what has been held back from their lives because of the lack of the consistency and quality of the relationship. The bottom line to if you do these things that are prior to verse 7 and down through verse 7, your prayers will not be hindered. Ouch. Yep. The quality of your relationship with your spouse, your husband or wife, your prayers being answered can depend on that so very much. Heard it said that, well, why would that hinder you if you're doing what God said do? What? I don't know. Maybe it's because the Bible says something about it. These things I know, they're living principles inside of a person who studies it and receives it and takes it in and appropriates it to their life. So sometimes you'll say things that the Bible says and don't even remember right at the moment exactly where, but listen, if you've been living in the word, it'll be there. Maybe it's because the Bible has something to say about that. I'm not just speaking that thing because it's, so when I, when I have to talk with people, counsel people, whatever, this, this comes up. How's your prayer life? I don't really pray. I, I, that, 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 okay. But, but what, what, do you, what proof do you have that your prayers are functioning well? If you are married or will be married, submission, honor, respect, and love in marriage is necessary to keep your prayers from being hindered. We will oftentimes blame the delays on God's timing or the enemy's interference, yet our unwillingness to function in unity on one accord with our relationships can interrupt or clog the pipeline of faith and therefore create significant delays in the answers to our prayers. We must use our spiritual and practical draino of love, respect, honor, and submission for the flow of, and supplica of supplication and request in prayer to be delivered. And I will stop here today. We will have to continue with part two next week. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you all for joining us here in person. Hopefully we have learned something. I can't wait to open up the barrels on the rest of this part right here because it's going to be like a blast of a, of a shotgun loaded with, with, with buckshot. It is fantastic because we're learning the pipeline and platform. We're learning how to pray and how to get prayers answered. Effective prayer that always manifests an answer. And you got to know what holds you up from getting those answers as well as what gets you to the answer. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace, your mercy and your truth. We thank you, Father, that you have visited us today and you're always with us and that you have come into this place 
as, as we have walked in here together in our hearts and you have magnified and multiplied your word, your glory, and your power, and you have moved expediently among the, upon the lives of those who are here in person and those watching by way of social media. We love you today, Father. We thank you. Let this, this message and your word marinate in our hearts and hi, that we hide your word in our hearts that we may not sin against you so that we can walk in the fullness of your glory and, and, and benefits of what you have established for us. But most of all, God, so that you can be glorified and others can see you and ask, what must I do to be saved? We love you, Father. We thank you. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Thank you. Amen. I want to remind everyone we are New Beginning Celebration, 3400 Trent Road, Suite D, New Bern, North Carolina. The email address is nbcelebration at yahoo.com, and the phone number is 252-631-2188. Visit our website, nbcelebration at uh, nbcelebration.com, and you can like us on Facebook. We do have Facebook, uh, New Beginnings Celebration, and we have a YouTube channel, Celebrating New Beginnings. We love you. We thank you so much. We love all of you who are here with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining us whichever way you have chosen, and we, we look forward to dining on God's Word with you next week. Have a fantastic Sunday.